Let's start the second part of our program. I am Hernan Marvileski. Let's start. We are going to we have a, uh, our speaker is Jose Luis Cordero, is an electronic engineer and network engineers engineer. He's going to present general proposers of broad band uh, carriers uh, with uh, IPv6 directorate uh, with IPv6 XLAT. 464 XLAT. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. We are going to start with the presentation of this initiative. The name is rather long, rather tricky, but uh, we will unfold it. Let's start. Very briefly, tell me, let me tell you the background. What led me to this, to start this initiative, this work? What everybody knows that the depletion of I public IPv4 addresses is a fact. However, IPv, uh, the ISPs need to continue to provide services. So uh, the alternative is CGNAT. Some uh, others dual stack, and just a few have achieved IPv6 only deployments. However, if I consider what happened in my country, Bolivia, the deployment of IPv6 in my country is a bit delayed if you compare it to the rest of the countries in the region. So. This causes some technology delay. We're lagging behind. So let me briefly show you the statistics obtained from Google, Meta, Lucknick's official page on the current status of the deployment of IPv6 in our country. We are 12th in Lucknick's ranking. And to date, about of 18 ISPs, only two have had quite considerable deployments uh, in IPv6. One of them, uh, well, Kotemko Intel, and the rest of the ISPs have deployments close to zero, if not zero. So here, we have a problem. One is, of course, the prolonged use of carrier-grade NAT, in some cases, Duostag, and the broadband ISP operators in Bolivia. So probably, well, the causes, of course, are the deletion of the IPv4 addresses. And the consequence is, of course, that it will end up limiting the diversification of services. It will increase the cost of investment and uh, the technology, technology delay of uh, the country. Another problem that we have seen in my country and probably can be replicated to countries in the other regions is the low priority of prioritization or or uh, how little resources are being uh, devoted to deploying IPv6 in, in Bolivia, for sure, and probably in other countries. As to the causes, the size of the market and the population in Bolivia, we are uh, a large country geographically, but barely 11 million people, so the market is quite reduced. And as a consequence, of course, we are having a long co uh, living with the technologies like carrier grade NAT and technology uh, delay for not implementing IPv6. So the objectives of this proposal was to somehow help the ISPs, maybe not the largest ones, like uh, the one that uh, they mentioned earlier this morning, one of the largest ISPs in the in Bolivia, but uh, to uh, start with a genetic uh, um, uh, proposal of a broadband carry grade, uh, a, a broadband ISP that could uh, not uh, do without carrier grade NAT and do a stack through the implementation of uh, the transition mechanism 464XLAT. So this will diversify the services, reduce the cost, reduce the technology gap, and it's a uh, 
a design and, and it's an end to end implementation of IPv6. We got through 464 XLET and LAT, and it could be the real basis, the template, not just for Bolivia, but for other countries in the region for the initial implementation of IPv6 in their network. So how d did we start this? Of course, we know we have to know where we stand. So investigating the architecture of the ISPs, we did a, a survey of uh, the existing uh, ISPs, and we can generalize, very standard, very generic, and if there are several ISPs, you, must have, you may have a typology like this. We start in the border where as ISPs we tend to connect to an international ISP in the case of Bolivia the uh, we uh, we have we connect to the ISP in Peru through a border router where we do the BGP peering inside we have our the core uh, routing where we have and in we there we have we connect them um, the CGNet to the ISPs that have it. Then in our border route, we tend to connect our DNSs, usually a recursive DNS, internal DSP, and an author authoritative DNS. In this session of the border router, we uh, typically put our caches, uh, Netflix, uh, Google, Meta, Kamai. And uh, the broadest uh, thing is the deployment of a uh, an MPLS uh, network that is usually um, all uh, along its coverage. In this section that is the most numerous, we have backbone routers. The part that is closer to the access it has smaller routers. And outside of that, we have the access networks, for instance, the GPONG network. And beside that, we have the GPs and the end uh, uh, devices, uh, the computers, the laptops. So those end users, um, at initially they were given IPv4 only. And then some uh, providers m mounted the dual stack, providing global um, IPv6. Um, and then we did a project engineering with three key pillars. The first design implementation and uh, lab tests and simulation here. We don't work with real networks, only lab and simulation in a lab that is used uh, uh, where we have mimicked trying to replicate each of the state steps of the uh, ISPs in the three scenarios. The first is mounting a dual stack ISP with IPv4 public and uh, global IPv6, then um, a dual stack ISP but using private IPv4, using CGNAT plus global IPv6, and there we, we have made this work, an ISP with a 464 XLAT, uh, XLAT, XLAT uh, uh, trying to get IPv6 only in the end. The second key pillar was taking at least uh, this uh, uh, cost analysis that uh, this, because this is the part that sometimes it's more difficult for us to sustain to owners, the CEOs, the stakeholders, general managers, and that you have to convince them with numbers. So here we have the basis. So based on the activities that are typically considered for any deployment, a very generic timetable has been included considering the key things that should be considered in each project. The main technologies, of course, we saw the IP networks, the routing protocols, MPLS, and NAT, uh, and we also developed uh, uh, an IPv6 uh, addressing plan. Here you see the prefix of documentation that we use for that uh, sort of lab test. However, this can be easily adaptable to any prefix that ISPs have because we know that almost by default, LACNIC or the regional IRRs give a segment, a segment with slash 32. So if you wanted to use it or to adapt it, you have to replace the first 32 bits for the prefix that you have been assigned. So the lab tests here in GNS3, 
we have mimicked each of the parts of uh, the uh, here. This is an international router that has access to the internet, then our border router, then the DNS in, uh, an on, in a, a Linux machine, and inside I mimicked an MPLS, uh, an MPLS with six devices, and then outside to our access network is uh, uh, simulating a GPON network from the simplest point of view. GPON is like a layer one, layer two, so here we uh, do it in the simplest way. And then we mounted a CPE. In this case, um, this we used an open source um, using uh, version 1907 and 19 and then an open writ and we used a Windows 10 a virtual machine um, then we made it operate with dual stack and then we added a CGNAT element to simulate to see what it could be like to give the end users a, um, a dual stack with private IPv4 and global IPv6. Many providers that have a dual stack working, that's what we do. I think it goes hand in hand with a presentation by my colleagues uh, a while ago. So here, the only thing that we did was to add CGNAT to do this stage. And then here, once you understand the dual stack here we put this to uh, this scenario 464x flat adding clat and glat that are necessary and plat the plat is a nat 60 nat 64 and the slat in the cp and we used the cp open rt version 19017 and we loaded the complement that supports 464x flat, and with that we made it work. So the results, these are res the results from our device and, and uh, computer where we can see that it has received global IPv6 and uh, IP, private IPv4, and we did all the tests necessary to IPv6 uh, and to IPv4 only and to dual stack scenarios. Here we show some uh, uh, CLAT, or, and we see that in interface one, as this is a PV, IPv6 only, uh, scenario, you only receive IPv6, but uh, inside in the LAN interface, you receive IPv. It provides the uh, end users I, global IPv6 addresses, but also private IPv4. So we also check that with 464 um, uh, ladder, uh, the, the CGNAT was no longer working as a translator. However, when we wanted to, to access the IPv4 in our end user, the uh, uh, NAT64 464 started to work. And then in the dual stack scenario, we use with uh, the two stacks, the uh, two protocols. This is reflected in the router's routing tables in the IPv4 and IPv6. However, when we go to the 464x LAT, the routing table is in IPv6 only, generating uh, uh, so using the resources. Some general advantages, well, the uh, the red supports IPv4 and IPv6, but it has some disadvantages. It does not uh, eliminate the problem of the repletion of IPv4 addresses. There's the complexity of administration because as if they were two networks, so you need more resources in your uh, machines. So you need to continue to invest in CGNAT. Then you have to continue to buy IP addresses. There are no longer any officially. But you, although you can get some through the IP brokers, some advantages of 464x LAT, um, it's a functional network that supports IPv6 and also IPv4 as a service. Uh, 
Gradually, we would eliminate the cost of investment of CGNAT, and we also eliminate the need of buying more uh, IP4 addresses. There are no longer any. And you simplify the administration of the network because in the past, in the future, we might handle only one plane. And that's what we are aiming at. And by having an IPv6 only network, we would be better for uh, new services that come hand in hand uh, with uh, uh, fi IoT and 5G, etc. And uh, the addresses that we release, we could resell them as ISPs if that is the decision, of course, bringing new revenues. And something that is good to mention is that mobile ISP operators, the uh, compatibility of the devices is quite high. Android is, uh, has been supporting it for several years in, in iOS. They also support IPv6 only for some time. So a while ago, they recommended to that instead of giving their mobile customers a dual stack, rather aim at using this for 6, for x -Lite. And the disadvantage is for the broadband CPEs. I've seen that there are not many CPEs compatible to date. They go up and up each day. There are some that have uh, vendors that, uh, that work, but the ISP that deploys this kind of services needs to consider that. As to cost, this is very important important because this is the way we're going to justify this to our seniors uh, management. This is a comparative table so with some reference uh, and I, this is what I think is essential. Um, what is the initial investment, buying the machines, designing the solution, implementing the solution as such, and of course, training. That's very important. Technical and non-technical people telling them what IPv6 is. Without that, you wouldn't be able to tell much. And the cost, the alarming cost for some is for a, a large ISP that could buy a uh, certain brand, but even smaller ISPs, they could choose open source uh, using dual tools that we mentioned on, uh, on Monday, you could optimize costs. Now, uh, there has been a small analysis. What are the things that we can uh, get by deploying IPv6 only? Yes, if eventually we're going to quit buying CGNAT, then we could save money deploying this. These are positive nu numbers. And if I release IPv addresses because I don't need them, I would not. I would no longer buy them. Here, as a reference, I took the price of a provider that is here at the event. And as an additional layer, we have the potential revenues that some ISPs could get reselling or transferring their IPs that are no longer being used. As you release IPv, as you get IPv6, you can release IPv4s, and that could be a sort of justification for new revenues. So we will put this all into a table, assuming an average ISP that. Um, expands the CGNAT every two years, some could do it every three years, every four years, some every year. So I took this, uh, I just put every two years. The first year, it's okay. Sometimes we see red figures, but after the second year, things change. And uh, the scenario seems quite convenient. Why could the ISP use this as a reference to justify this? And so here, we have the most important activities that as an ISP, as an experience, I've seen that are necessary, uh, starting with the approval of the, of the project. Uh, and once we have uh, the support of the executive part, we can start with training, a survey of all the devices of our ISP network. We do the, we purchase the machines necessary, and we start developing our design stage. And of course, then we start with the implementation, starting with a test. Um, a, a pilot test uh, period under controlled environment and then start with a massive controlled migrations. In closing, as I said, for this initiative, we uh, did a survey of a generic architecture that can be used in my country, Rennie, in the region, even globally, I would dare say. 
Well, we have understood the needs of each stage of the network, specifically the IP network because the, uh, of the ISP that can have many components. If we focus on the IPs, um, the design and implementation of the IP network of an I, a broadband ISP and GNS3 and 4 with 4 Six four x slide assigning IPv6 addressing and to final uses and to, we did a comparative analysis between dual stack and four six four x slide and we did a simulation with uh, the virtual images of router Cisco iOS S fifteen point six. This is six years old, so it can be adapted to any other vendor that uh, the different ISPs can use. The associate uh, cost uh, <coughs> have evaluated. Uh, uh, what is uh, what are the revenues that could uh, get and what are the savings <coughs> this network will reduce dependence on the ipv4 addressing and one of the key motivations of this initiative is that at the beginning this scenario can be adapted to any kind of network and it would be sort of a kicker for these deployments the information will be public absolutely everything will be published in LACNIC so that if you want to start using it, you can adapt it to your ISP, including configuration files, etc. Of course, in coordination with the LACNIC people. And final recommendations for any ISP operator. We know that all new equipment has to come, have some IPvC support. And for this scenario, you have to check that any purchases may support this transition mechanism 464 x slide whenever necessary, for instance, with ISPs. And summarizing for an adequate interpretation and non flawed of the protocol of the IPv6 protocols, the ISP operators should apply the second. First, to manage the sponsoring and support from the CEOs, general managers, senior management to justify the approval of the project through cost benefit analysis because it's the only way we can convince them. Without that, the project will not be viable. And will be uh, uh, stopped. Then after that, we have to train the entire company, technical and non-technical people. It's important for the people in sales to know that this can be sold. And then in the implementation part, we do an integrated plan. We do a survey of all the network and integrated planning and implementation of the project. We execute the test plan before launching it. And finally, we migrate in a controlled manner. That's all. Thank you for your time. Here, I leave my contact data. If you wanted to go uh, deeper into this information, I'm open to questions, suggestions, claims, whatever. Gracias, Jose Luis. Thank you, Abrimos Jose Luis. Para que we open the microphone. Si no hay, si no hay Are there any questions? Okay, a round of applause to Jose Luis. Thank you.